Let's talk about how the gut differentiates artificial sweeteners from sugar. Yeah. So there's some research that found that the gut has similar cells to those that allow for taste on the tongue and smell on the nose, and that those sensors also have direct contact with neurons in our brain. So obviously with that connection in the brain, when you ingest sugar, it stimulates certain cells in the gut and those cells release what's called glutamate and activate the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is, we've talked about it many times, it's basically a, a nerve that regulates between the internal organ functions, such as digestion, between the brain and the gut. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of this like highway, communication highway between the brain and the gut. And what they observed is that these gut sensor cells, which they called neuropods, scientists are so nerdy, uh, transmit <laughs> this sent information milliseconds after detecting the sugar, like immediately after detecting the sugar. And they delve deeper to find out that this gut to vagus pathway discriminates between sugar and artificial sweeteners. So basically real sugar versus artificial sweeteners, your brain and your gut Mm -hmm. differentiate them. Yeah. And it's, 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 so interesting. And basically this was done on mice. So obviously, yep. and a lot of research is done on mice because mice are very similar mitochondrial wise and cellular makeup wise to humans, but they perfused sucrose or sucralose directly into the gut and then analyzed the response of neurons that make up that vagus nerve using calcium imaging. So on average, 40.7% responded to sucrose only. to sucralose only, and the remainder to neither stimulus, explaining how the vagus nerve is able to basically react differently to the two substances. Yeah, this is pretty wild. So just to not confuse you guys, um, sucrose is just straight sugar, basically, right? So they performed this assessment, right? And they're looking at different molecular receptors on these neuropods. And they also showed that neuropods sense sugars through something known as our sodium glucose transport and artificial sweeteners through a T1R3, a sweet taste receptor that when activated releases the neurotransmitter ATP. So with this, it also blocked glutamate receptors in the gut using antagonist, which decreased the vagal nerve response to sugar and silence response, um, you know, to the sucrose. So, or sucralose, I should say. So this is, this is kind of pretty crazy, right? When we're looking at this based upon the results, they conclude that the entry of sugar and sucralose into the neuropod cell, a cell stimulates the release of glutamate, which activates that vagus nerve and is involved in reward signaling. This is where I think it gets really interesting, right? So it's looking at straight sugar and this is like that dopamine response, that reward, but with sucralose or no to low calorie sweeteners, okay, they released ATP, activating a different gut brain pathway. So this makes me wonder, and I'll have to do more research around this. What about the addiction? Because I don't believe that we see people addicted to these low calorie sweeteners the Mm -hmm. way that we see people addicted to sugar, which is found in so many things. And here's where you could break it down to any type, right? Like high um, fructose corn syrup, Mm -hmm. right? That is hidden in, I don't even know. I I believe the stats last time I read it was like two thirds of the things in the grocery store. Um, Pretty wild. So- it's just fascinating to me that your body, like your gut microbes is responding completely different because as we dive into artificial sweeteners or what we would say sugar substitutes here, what is interesting is that those ingredients, right? So this is again, sucralose, um, that's in that category, aspartame and so forth. And we'll get into this, but that can vary in terms of sweetness that your taste buds recept, right? So it's anywhere between 200 to 20,000 times sweeter on your taste buds than table sugar, which allows, this is why manufacturers can use them in such small concentrations without having a lot of impact on Mm -hmm. calories, right? And so this is really interesting. So the FDA considers the most artificial sweeteners to be non-nutritive sugar substitutes, okay? Many consumers view these as calorie-free. However, they're not technically. So they have about four calories per gram and it's considered carbohydrates. Any sugar is considered carbohydrate. So when you're consuming that in high concentration, 
that is calories that you're consuming, which we wouldn't recommend consuming these things in high concentrations anyway, because they are exactly as the name states, artificial. And they alter the gut bacteria in humans. Um, and so I'm going to go off on this little tangent and then we're going to dive into some of the really cool stuff around this, but particularly sucralose. I have done some reels on this and read um, a variety of different studies, which I pulled up uh, as well to pull in here. Not only does it impact the intestinal microbiome in terms of the bacterial communities, it's also shown to impact insulin signaling, blood glucose levels, as it alters the body's ability to regulate blood glucose. And this is what they're now connecting to maybe higher rates of, you know, being part Mm -hmm. of what's contributing to the higher rates of disease um, that we have. But the sucralose, well, this was just in, in as little as two weeks of consuming this every day, has been associated with disrupting the balance of the gut microbiome, feeding specific uh, bacteria that we don't necessarily want to feed. And we know that with certain bacteria in the gut microbiome, they can actually make you extract more calories from food. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, And so that was pretty cool to just kind of see like all these connections coming together. And there's still you know research that needs to be done, but- the take home in this piece before we get into like the, what the research says, just because it is low calorie, no calorie or whatever they're saying, sugar-free, like whatever, doesn't mean that there are not repercussions and doesn't mean that it's not impacting your blood glucose levels. Yeah. I think that it's not like you're taking an air, like there, this is a chemical. There's going to be some type of intern chemical response within the body and particularly with sucralose, there is, you know, studies and research that show long-term sucralose consumption induces gut dysbiosis, which is basically leaky gut overgrowth of certain gut bacteria. And that in turn can alter your insulin and glucose levels like Liz was talking about. And they've shown that it's associated with this change in metabolism and the way that our body processes and responds with glucose, because essentially when you consume these, the body senses the sugar or the sucralose and it identifies it as a sweetener. And so here's the thing, even though there's not necessarily quote unquote calories associated with that, the body still responds as if there are. And so it will still increase glucose in the bloodstream. It will still release insulin. And so you're, if you're doing these non-sugar sweeteners all day long, well, your body's going to basically have a reaction as if it's sugar. And so what they find in a lot of this stuff is like they change ultimately the gut microbiome. They, they alter the intestinal bacteria and then that impacts your metabolism. It impacts your appetite. It impacts how your body stores fat. And unfortunately, the food industry doesn't like that. <laughs> and these studies that were used, the food industry, the FDA basically came up with a ton of reasons why the study wasn't any good. And mainly that it wasn't done in humans when, let's be honest, a lot of studies are done on mice and are used and are, you know, justified and totally valuable and valid. But in this case, the this would impact the FDA and would impact the, the food industry in a negative way because they can use these super, super sweet chemicals in small amounts to make food more appetizing for people and more addictive to an extent. So just some really interesting... Yeah, super crazy. And just if you dive further into the research, which I have didn't have enough time this morning, there's actually research showing where in the GI tract it impacts the microbes uh, the most, and that's in the small intestine. And that can also play a big role in our immunity. So mm-hmm. just a lot of things to consider here, right? And so even though, uh, you know, the, the research was done on mice and that was, you know, obviously... They came up with a a zillion reasons why that the study is then no good. Now what's happening, and this um, was actually in August of last year, there is a lab, um, the Wiesman Institute of Science and Immunological Lab, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter who all of these articles are because it doesn't make any sense to you, right? But they have taken an array of common artificial sweeteners, okay? So they're looking at saccharin, sucralose, aspartame, and stevia, which I think you guys are probably like, aha, they're going to talk about stevia because we know that stevia is, you know, technically uh, a sugar alternative. It's more natural found in nature, um, but it, it is in this class. And so their findings suggest that these sweeteners do all alter the gut microbiome. Um, but again, we're going to blame the two major ones, saccharin and sucralose. Okay. Um, aspartame. I don't even think we need to talk about that. That's been shown 
for years to be linked with Alzheimer's and, and so mm-hmm. forth. But again, we think about Alzheimer's and inflammation and blood sugar dysregulation and things crossing the blood brain barrier, blah, blah, blah. Um, but what they're seeing here is that there has, you know, basically been indications that this is leading to weight gain and diabetes because of how it's adversely impacting the glucose tolerance, which we know is a measure of how blood sugar moves through the bloodstream into the muscle and fat. Okay. And so in the past several decades, we've seen a massive increase in these metabolic uh, conditions and those all are impacted and arise from impaired glucose. And so the strategy in this study of using non-calorie, you know, sweeteners, um, was basically what they were kind of looking to see, is this beneficial, you know, or not? Um, and so what they did is they divided it into four groups, uh, that consumes six commercially available sachets of either aspartame, saccharin, sucralose, or stevia every day for 14 days. As all four sweeteners contain the sugar glucose as a bulking agent, the fifth group received an equivalent amount of glucose, five grams, straight sugar, while the sixth had placebo, no intervention. So all participants measured their blood glucose levels before, during, and after the treatment period using a glucose monitor that was attached to their upper arm, continuous glucose monitor. Okay. They also performed glucose tolerance tests. Those are the really shitty ones. We have to drink Uh, the solution, right? To evaluate the body's glycemic response and measuring how quickly blood glucose levels uh, return to baseline after the glucose was consumed. And then they also, this is the part that I liked most, is they collected their stool and their saliva samples to look at their microbiomes. When the researchers profiled the participants' oral and gut microbiomes, they found that there were significant differences in the populations of bacteria before and after regular ingestion of artificial sweeteners, particularly for participants who took sucralose and saccharin. The control groups that ingested glucose or took no supplement did not experience changes in their microbiomes. Now, the only thing that I didn't see in here, and I wish that, you know, Uh, maybe I missed it. Uh, I'll have to go back, but I didn't see anything around Stevie and I didn't see anything specifically about aspartame. But Mm -hmm. again, we know that sucralose is one that's been studied for a long time. So I think you just need to be smart and anything that you're consuming, right? When we, where would we find these things? You're going to find that a lot in like diet sodas. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be the first person to tell you, I'm not going to, you know, yell, throw rocks at a glass house. I drink a diet soda every now and then, right? I really like a diet Dr. Pepper. Uh, is this something I'm ingesting every day? No. In my home, I cook with stevia, monk fruit, coconut sugar, honey, agave. That's mainly what I use. And there's no judgment here, you know, for what you're using, but I think it's important to start reading labels and it's important to recognize just because something is calorie free doesn't mean that it's risk-free. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about sugar alcohols because that's another big class. Oh yeah. So sugar alcohols are carbohydrates that are used as sweeteners and bulking agents in foods. So some sugar alcohols occur naturally, things like fruits, vegetables, but most are produced from other sugars. So they're most commonly used as sweeteners, but they are also used to help preserve moisture and improve texture of foods. And they have a chemical structure that basically combines the structure of sugar and alcohol molecules However, they do not obviously contain the type of alcohol that makes you drunk. Uh, So sugar alcohols belong to a class of carbohydrates that are known as polyols, which are a type of FODMAP. This is why a lot of people that have SIBO or really bad GI system dysfunction really struggle with like protein bars and, you know, the more quote unquote Mm -hmm. healthy alternatives to candy bars. (laughs) Um, And the most common sugar alcohols, all of them end in OL basically. So, or I-T-O-L, xylitol, erythritol, sorbitol, malitol, mannitol, lacetol, isomalt. So what is the difference between sugar alcohol and sugar? Sugar alcohols have basically a similar chemical structure, but they provide fewer calories and are actually less sweet. So some contain zero calories, but others have still about half to a third as many calories as sugar. Sugar alcohols are slightly different comparatively to sugar alternatives because sugar alcohols do act as carbohydrates in the body. So they actually, the thing about this is that you will see on nutrition labels a lot of times that there are no calories, but there are carbs Mm -hmm. and that's where they get you. 
there's no possible way for there to be no calories, but for there to be carbs. And it is because of sugar alcohols. So the main reason that they're allowed to do that is because sugar alcohols are not completely absorbed in the bloodstream like sugar is. And so it gives them a lower glycemic index, which means they don't technically raise blood sugar as much as regular sugar does. And unlike sugar, sugar alcohols do not cause tooth decay apparently. So xylitol in particular has actually been found to protect the enamel of your teeth from bacteria and reduce plaque buildup. So, but how, we'll talk about xylitol yes. because xylitol doesn't come without its, its nope, risk. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> so you can tell if foods contain sugar alcohols because packaged foods, if you read the ingredient list under nutrition facts label, it will let you know that a product contains sugar alcohols. So you won't always see them listed in the nutrition fact portion because the FDA does not require them to put them there, but you will see it in the actual ingredient list. Um, and under a lot of times total carbohydrates. So if one, if only one sugar alcohol is used in a product, you may see the specific sugar alcohol actually listed. Yep. So where can we find them? Protein powder, sugar substitutes, chewing gum, mints, toothpaste, some medicines. If you look on the back of that, right, like cough syrups, throat lozenges, things like that. Many things out there marked as low carb, keto friendly, sugar free. Mm -hmm candies, soft drinks, right? All yep. of these things. And so let's talk a little bit about, you know, what, what do these things uh, do and what are some of the side effects? And I think it's really, you know, one of the, the things where we would say, again, everything in moderation, right? Um, with the exception of erythritol, that's not uh, xylitol. So xylitol is actually what we do like. Yeah. Erythritol is the one that we don't like, and we'll talk about that. But they're not usually bad for you when consumed in moderation. Uh, however, depending upon your gut microbiome, uh, it can cause you some GI upset. And that's mainly because these things, especially xylitol, serve as prebiotics, which help feed probiotics or the good bacteria in your gut microbiome. Uh, and so depending upon the state of your gut, um, I do know that some individuals can have, you know, GI distress, abdominal pain, cramping, bloating, things like that. So I would just say it kind of, you know, depends upon you uh, and what you're dealing with. We also know that it can be a more of a stimulant. So mm -hmm. if you're severely constipated, I talk about this in the constipation cure, you can chew, uh, you can chew gum with xylitol, more of a natural chewing gum. And it works for a couple different reasons. Um, one, the xylitol itself, but also what you're doing when you're chewing is you're stimulating and kind of the body thinks that it's, um, you know, uh, eating. And so it needs to start to work to push things down to like prepare for food. So more food coming through the digestive tract. So if you don't struggle with constipation, some people have reported that, uh, you know, they, they do experience more diarrhea. Mm -hmm. Um, urethritol, which one of the things we don't like here has been linked to higher risk of blood clots. Um, more risk is obviously, or more research is obviously needed. If you are at a high risk of heart problems, I would recommend avoiding uh, this particular sugar alcohol. Um, but again, this is not medical advice. You should always speak with your doctor if you are concerned and make sure that you you know definitely get checked out. Another big reason, and I think this goes for both sugar substitutes as well as sugar alcohols, is that a lot of these are mainly found uh, in processed foods, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're a bulking agent. Um, and what we know is that ultra processed foods, sometimes the brain doesn't even really recognize these uh, you know, calories, for example, and therefore you can have increased appetite, weight gain, diabetes. Um, and, you know, I just think it's, it's always uh, something for you to kind of evaluate, like, when would I be using this? And why would I be using it? Mm -hmm. um, certainly, I think if you're traveling and you got a protein bar that had something and it didn't bother you, yeah. you know, here nor there, that's a, a different story. But yeah. And I think something that I remember hearing a long time ago, and I forget where I heard it from, but Kind of the concept of, if you think about processed foods, like chips or popcorn, I mean, popcorn's a little bit less processed, but things like chips, like a Pringle, for example, it's kind of like eating air to the body. It doesn't mm -hmm. really have a whole lot of substance like a vegetable does with fiber or fruits or protein or like a potato. And so it really doesn't trigger as much of a filling feeling in the body as if you were eating a big salad or you were having a smoothie. I mean, smoothies are a little bit less filling. I feel like I keep picking bad examples, but essentially a lot of people wonder how can I sit here and eat like this bag of chips and still be hungry comparatively if I ate this huge bowl of vegetables, you know, or I had this really big meal of a steak and butter. And it's because these foods are not meant to trigger fullness. Like you're, 
the FDA, the food industry, wants you to consume and overconsume these products. And so they're not going to make them very filling. And that is why you have to be really careful and conscious of how you're consuming these things because they will get you in the hole of, well, I wasn't even, I wasn't even full afterwards, right? Like I didn't have that sensation of being full. And then an hour later I ate again. And then two hours later I ate again. And then you're in this kind of vicious cycle of never actually feeling satiated. And now you're down the rabbit hole of cravings all the time. And you know, you're, you're playing this game of like, well, it wasn't that many calories because it had sugar alcohols or it had like sugar alternatives. It was zero sugar, you know, sugar free, never, <laughs> Be careful with those things because typically if it's sugar-free, it's not sugar-free. It's just got different alternatives in it that might not be as great for you. Um, if it's fat-free, it's definitely got added sugar in it. So like you got to kind of be smart about a lot of these things because if you look at portion sizes and serving sizes on things, they are extremely deceiving. We've talked about this before. And if you are not full from eating a good amount of them, it's probably because it's lacking some type of nourishment for you because nourishment is filling and satiating. We work on this all the time with our clients when they come into us and they think they're eating healthy and we put them onto our flush and they're like, I've never eaten this much food before. It's like reality, you're actually not eating that many calories. It's just that type of food is so much more filling because it's got fibers and it's got fats and healthy fats and protein and just nutrients because a lot of people are just so nutrient void in their like internally that their body's basically yelling at them to eat more, i.e. your cravings. But in reality, you're not filling it with nourishment. You're just like, oh, well, I'm having cravings. So I eat chocolate or I eat, you know, chips or whatever it might be, or I, you know, binge on whatever. Your body's dying for nourishment. And that's what it's asking you to go find. But, you know, it can't send that exact signal to the brain. It's sending like, go eat. And then we see it with cravings. Yeah. And I think a lot of times, and we've done a podcast on this before, is like, what are your cravings telling you? It's really that you need like minerals, vitamins, amino acids, right? The All the things that Becca was mentioning, but specifically, you know, think about a female who's always saying, well, like, I just want, you know, chocolate around my period. Your body's probably craving magnesium, mm -hmm. right? You want more red meat. You just want a juicy burger. Yeah. You're probably craving some iron, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, and so I think it's also being smart. And, you know, I always say to people, you got to live life too. But at the end of the day, ask yourself, how many times am I getting this, let's say air quote craving, and then I'm going to this food or whatever it might be, or I think that this is a better alternative when in reality it's not because it's just further driving the cravings. Like how about you eat some real whole food first and see how you feel? Do you still have that craving? Mm -hmm. um, how about you drink some water with some electrolytes and like, do you still have that craving? And a lot of this is mental. I'm going to be straight up. I think a lot of this is the habits that you have created. It's the rationalization in your yes. mind that you deserve something such as a ice cream or a soda or an icy or a lollipop or whatever it might be. And I think a lot of this also can be from childhood, mm -hmm. right? Like I know for us, you know, I've tried to be very intentional and we're not perfect, but we're still working on it. Marcus, he will go for sugar anytime. It's dopamine. It's sweet, right? It's meant mm -hmm. to be addicted. Right. And so he'll ask me for things like after school, did you bring me a snack? Okay. Well, yes, but let's have some yogurt. Let's have some vegetable. He does yeah. really good with his lunches at school. So I don't mind if he has like a little like sucker or something, but like you can't come home and like drink juice all the time. So you can have water. We do uh, use stevia droppers. We can also use um, like his, we get like the organic like juices or whatever, mm -hmm. like 60 calories, something along those lines or the poppies. And I'm fine with you doing like one of those a day, but if I let him live off those things, he would. And that would also lead to this constant cycle, you know, that I need to have sugar. I need to have sugar. And so we have rules in our house too. Like Protein before anything else. Like if you are going to have a little bit of ice cream, that's fine. But we're going to have some protein first. We're going to have eggs, we're going to have yogurt, protein cereal, whatever that might look like. So I think just be mindful of, you know, that too, in terms of what you are really saying, like these cravings are coming from, because I think there's uh, more mental cravings a yep. lot of times than maybe even like that physical craving. So, and then, you know, we just, to wrap this up, what I would say is see how everything makes you feel. Right. And I always try to, you know, just think about how much is it coming in every day? I don't believe. And I know that there are some people that have demonized stevia online. I want to touch on this too, because I also found the answer that I'm going to wrap this up with going back to the glucose around stevia. But 
some people were demonizing stevia uh, a couple months back. And when you look at it in the research, that article, because I was talking to another practitioner, the amounts of stevia they were giving mice were like absurd. They, like you wouldn't even as a human consume that in a day. Like yeah. why, I don't know why they were doing such obscene <laughs> like levels of uh, stevia they were giving these mice. But, um, you know, every, the devil's in the dose with everything. Yep. So going back, uh, just to wrap this up, to touch on that. So we talked about a little early on in the episodes, what the researchers found when they profiled the participants oral and gut microbiome, right? So if you guys recall 10 minutes ago or so, we talked about this. They found that there were significant differences in the populations of bacteria before and after ingesting artificial sweeteners, particularly for those who took sucralose and saccharin. Now, what did they find? Um, they also found not just that the bacteria had changed or the microbiome had changed in the oral and the gut microbiome, but the participants who had sucralose and saccharin also exhibited larger peaks in blood glucose in their um, glucose tolerance tests conducted during the treatment period than those in the glucose control group, suggesting that these sweeteners may push the body towards glucose intolerance where tissues struggle to absorb glucose from the blood, aka let's talk about you know, insulin intolerance as mm -hmm. well, right? Um, no significant differences in glycemic responses were observed for the glucose only aspartame or stevia groups when compared with no intervention. So what does this come down to? I thought this was a really good quote. This guy, um, this doctor says, this is fundamental because it proves causation, not just correlation. So all that stuff that you're drinking, that's sugar-free, that is, you know, especially if it's sucralose or saccharin, I would even put aspartame. I don't care what aspartame does to your blood glucose levels. It's horrible for you. Just stay away from it. Be really, really cautious about how often you're consuming these things. Um, especially if you're somebody who is dealing with a chronic underlying, you know, health condition, a metabolic issue, uh, diabetes, you have blood sugar imbalances. Mm -hmm. We are seeing more and more, you know, people's livers are struggling. I think two thirds of the people, uh, their livers are struggling, right? If we, if we got a blood glucose monitor on everybody, I'm sure we would find that, you know, it's more than two thirds for people with blood sugar levels. Cause that usually happens before liver issues arise. So just be really, you know, mindful about these things and swap things out, right? Even though honey has some calories or coconut sugar has some calories. Even for people who are diabetic, coconut sugar doesn't impact, um, doesn't have the high glycemic response the way that just straight Same sugar with date does. Sugar. Mm -hmm. Date sugar is a lot better for high glycemic index. Yeah. So there's definitely alternatives. And I would just say, if you are someone that is extremely overweight or trying to, you know, lose weight and you're struggling, I would not turn to a ton of artificial sweeteners, like turn to real foods. Turn yes. to whole foods. I would much rather someone eat an apple, have a bowl of berries versus think that they're doing a better job. Heck, by have some juice, have some hundred percent right? juice. That's not from concentrate. You pair that with some other things, you know, in your diet, in terms of like the fiber, the fat, the protein, you're at least getting the nutrients in there. And some people are like, Oh, well, what about the carbohydrates? Like we use the, the hundred percent uh, juice, not from concentrate in our first phase for a lot of people. And I still use them, you know, for other people who are struggling with sleep and things like that. And we're not saying that you have to just be guzzling juice. I'm not telling you to wake up and drink orange juice every day. Um, you know, but what we're saying is that I, I would, you know, argue that because of the health impacts, it would be better for you to have regular things, regular sugar or coconut sugar or date sugar, or some of these other things, um, that have calories like honey or agave in smaller doses, right? Like, I don't think you should load up your coffee with honey and I don't think you should load up your tea with honey, you know, but pair things and don't have any of this like naked, uh, carbohydrates, mm -hmm. right? Pair it with other stuff, but yeah, eat the, eat the real foods, drink the real, uh, juice. And we could, somebody can argue with me about, you know, you're stripping it of all of the fiber and all of this nonsense. I get it, but at least you're getting other antioxidants and vitamins and minerals and other nutrients that one might not be getting if they're continuing to drink a diet, Dr. Pepper. So I think it's just, you know, be wise, use your discernment, follow your gut, watch out, man. Like if you've got a quest bar and you've got a bunch of those sugar alcohols in there and you're getting that diarrhea, that bloating, that cramping, that abdominal pain, probably not the best thing for you. Mm -hmm. Right. So we just want to help, you know, clarify that for you. I had fun with it. Cause I was like, wow, I think it's so amazing that the, the cells in the body and the way that it impacts the vagus nerve and so all of this stuff. 
So, so interesting. So anyways, have a great Monday. If you have questions or requests, you know that you can always go to fitmomlife.com backslash ask to submit those and we will cover them in an upcoming episode.